Good morning. I'm Kenneth Moten. And I'm Janae Norman. Here are the top five things to know this Tuesday. Number one, the man who died in a helicopter crash on top of a New York skyscraper is being remembered as a seasoned pilot. 58-year-old Tim McCormack had 15 years of experience flying helicopters before yesterday's crash in restricted airspace. Investigators are looking into whether an erratically flying chopper in the area was the same one that went down on top of a 750-foot building. None of the workers inside the building was hurt, and safety inspectors say the building is fine other than minor damage at the crash scene. Number two, a sheriff's deputy in Los Angeles County is fighting for his life after being shot inside a jack-in-the-box restaurant. Officials said the officer was off-duty and wearing civilian clothes when the man shot him in the head. The suspect was seen fleeing in a white SUV. A motive remains unclear. On to number three, retired baseball star David Ortiz is back in Boston after being shot at a nightclub in the Dominican Republic. A police escort took him to Mass General Hospital overnight there in Boston. Doctors say he lost part of his colon, intestines, and gallbladder and also suffered damage to his liver. One suspect is in custody. Another man, possibly the shooter, remains on the loose. The motive is still unclear. The Red Sox paused at Fenway last night to pay tribute to Ortiz. His former teammate Pedro Martinez got emotional talking about him. I'm so disappointed to know that Someone like David, who saved so many lives, can have someone after his life. And I'm sorry, I get. <laughs> I'm sorry. But it hurts me. So many former teammates and fans pulling for Ortiz. The first request Ortiz made after surgery was to see his family. Number four, the basketball world is buzzing after an emotional game five of the NBA Finals. The Warriors stayed alive with a 106-105 win over the Raptors to force a game six in Oakland Thursday night. But that win came at a steep cost. Warriors star Kevin Durant returned to the court last night only to limp off with an injured Achilles. He has an MRI scheduled for today. And finally, number five, the most fun states to visit in America. Wallet Hub ranked the states based on the bang for your tour's buck and the accessibility of everything from parks to casinos. Here are the top five. California, Florida, New York, Washington, and Colorado. West Virginia ranked as the least fun. Aww. Yep. Let us know what you think. Tweet us at ABC News Live. Good morning, everyone. So let's get right to that top story, the new details about that deadly helicopter crash here in New York. Witnesses say it reminded them of 9-11 as smoke poured from a skyscraper after the chopper crashed on the roof. Investigators are now trying to determine why the pilot was flying in restricted airspace just blocks from Trump Tower. This morning, the search for answers after this deadly helicopter crash in Manhattan, not far from Times Square in restricted airspace. The chopper crashed into a skyscraper, erupting into flames at the top of the 54-story building. We felt the building shake. I thought a plane hit the building. New video shows a helicopter flying erratically in the area. Officials have not confirmed whether this was the doomed flight, but the crash came just minutes later, killing the pilot the only one on board. Only way I can describe it is like someone standing next to you and they give you a hard shove. Debris, including this chunk of the chopper, rained down onto the street below. This is all that's left of the wreckage on the roof. A senior FAA official says there's no indication this was terrorism related. If you're a, a New Yorker, you have uh, a level of PTSD, right, from 9-11. So as soon as you hear an aircraft hit a building, uh, I think my mind goes where every New Yorker's mind goes. Heavy rain and fog reduced visibility at the time. Some of the videos we saw today showed this helicopter flying right along the bases of those clouds, in and out of those clouds. So given how nasty the weather was in New York today, I'm quite sure that weather played a role in creating this mishap. When you look at his flight path, he was all over the place. He was almost doing figure eights. It indicated that he seemed very disoriented during the flight. The veteran pilot, 58-year-old Timothy McCormack, talked to our New York station back in 2014 after narrowly escaping an accident when his helicopter was hit by a bird. Speaking on the phone last night, his co-worker says McCormack likely chose that rooftop in Manhattan Monday for an emergency landing. He was a very competent, well-liked, respected individual in a professional aircraft who I think did his best in a bad situation 
and in the last moment may well have moved to try to spare the people on the ground. Helipads are not allowed on buildings in Manhattan because of safety precautions after this chopper crash on the Pan Am building in 1977. Airspace has also been restricted since President Trump was elected because of his home at Trump Tower. Investigators say McCormack never communicated with air traffic control, which is required in that area. Authorities say there's no evidence of any structural damage to that skyscraper. The investigation could take months. The pilot's family calls him a hero for landing on that roof and avoiding a larger tragedy. Now let's get to today's big story, a breakthrough in the standoff over evidence from the Mueller report that Democrats say could be crucial to impeachment findings. The Justice Department has now agreed to turn over that key evidence to a House committee. Meanwhile, lawmakers have now heard from the star witness in the Watergate hearings, a man President Trump calls a loser. ABC Serena Marshall has more on all of this from Washington. Good morning, Serena. Good morning, Kenneth Janae, and that hearing getting underway after that deal was announced, and they wanted to hear from a former White House counsel, but when they couldn't get President Trump's, they brought in President Nixon's. It's a contempt vote delayed, at least for now. The Justice Department and the House Judiciary Committee striking a deal, turning over some of the underlying documents from the Mueller report. We have a responsibility to do this work, to follow the facts where they lead. The deal follows weeks of tense negotiations and includes providing the committee interview notes, first-hand accounts of misconduct and other critical evidence, according to the chairman, and it stalls the planned vote that would hold the attorney general in contempt of Congress. But it didn't stop the hearings. After announcing the agreement, Chairman Nadler gaveling in the first in a series, scrutinizing those 10 incidents of possible obstruction of justice laid out in the Mueller report. They wanted to hear from White House counsel Don McGahn, but the White House directed him, along with other aides, not to testify. Instead, they brought in a different White House counsel, President Nixon's. In many ways, the Mueller report is to President Trump what the so-called Watergate roadmap was to President Richard Nixon. The president responding before it even began. President Nixon never got there. He left. I don't leave. There's a big difference. I don't leave. Look, John Dean's been a loser for many years. Congress will still vote today, though, on the Mueller report, empowering the committee to go straight to a judge and get more documents if negotiations with the Justice Department stall. But the attorney general isn't in the clear just yet. On Wednesday, a different committee, the House Oversight, plans to vote to hold him and Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross in contempt over the 2020 census question on citizenship. Kenneth Janae. Serena, thank you. Now to some other headlines we're watching. There are new questions about the security of personal data that federal agencies collect from us. U.S. Customs and Border Patrol says the images of tens of thousands of travelers was stolen during a data breach that targeted a subcontractor's website. The photos were used in a facial recognition program. Pictures of license plates crossing the border during a six-week period were also stolen. The data could provide valuable information to a foreign government. And new details about Kim Jong-un's murdered half-brother. He was reportedly working as a CIA informant. Sources tell the Wall Street Journal that Kim Jong-nam met several times with CIA operatives and was in contact with agents in China. He was living in exile when he was killed in 2017, so it's unclear what information he may have been able to provide. North Korea has denied claims that Kim Jong-un had him killed. Supporters of abortion rights in Missouri can claim a victory this morning. A judge ruled the state's last remaining open abortion clinic can remain open while a fight over its license plays out in court. That ruling extends an earlier order from the same judge, which temporarily blocked the state from allowing the clinic's license to expire. The judge also ordered Missouri's Department of Health to decide on renewing the clinic's license within the next 10 days. And North Carolina is issuing a warning against what it calls zombie snakes. The state Parks and Recreation Agency says the eastern hognose snake pretends to be dead by lying on its back. They're not poisonous, but they share several traits of cobras. When threatened, they hiss loudly and spread their necks. If that fails to scare off the threat, the snake plays dead. You might call them the slithering dead. A street in Brooklyn, New York, is now named for a man considered one of the greatest rappers of all time. Yesterday, a sign was revealed marking Christopher Notorious B.I.G. Wallace Way. Wallace was killed in a still unsolved drive-by shooting in Los Angeles in 1997 at the age of 24. His mother says her only son would be proud of the honor. I'm sure he would use some of his little phrase, yo, that's cool. <laughs> yo, that's cool. Or oh, Brooklyn, we did it. That they really cared for him. They really loved him. 
The unveiling took place on what would have been Biggie's 47th birthday. Love that mm -hmm. story. Spread love. It's the Brooklyn way. Mm -hmm. Coming up, we hear from the family of a boy rescued at sea. Their message for beachgoers and what that boy told rescuers about his unicorn raft after this. Now to the ABC News exclusive with the boy rescued after being swept out to sea. The eight-year-old drifted half a mile off the coast of North Carolina on a unicorn raft. And this morning, his parents have a message for anyone heading to the beach. I was really scared and thinking like I might die and all that stuff. It was supposed to be a fun family day at the beach, but it turned into a terrifying ordeal for this Ohio family when their young son drifted out to sea on a unicorn raft. My son is floating out in the middle of the ocean on a floaty thing. He doesn't have a life jacket on. He doesn't, he doesn't really know how to swim. Eight-year-old Declan drifted farther and farther away, his father jumping into action right away, but to no avail. As soon as we saw him moving away from shore, we went after him, and um, myself and his uncle Nick found pretty quickly that we weren't making ground. He was moving away from shore faster than we were. With authorities still on the way, a team of rescue volunteers headed out to sea, eventually bringing the young boy back to the beach. It was a lot of tears, exhalation, and thankful for those rescuers. Unfortunately, incidents like these are all too common. Stay back. Earlier this year, two five-year-old girls were rescued on this swan raft after they were swept out to sea. And last year, a young boy and his swan raft were the victim of a vicious rip current. I started to freak out like maybe we'll never make it back. We're goners. The boy spent half an hour stranded at sea before rescuers returned him to shore. As for Declan, his parents have a message for anyone using large rafts this summer season. And make sure that they're anchored or that you have a rope that someone's holding on to so it can't pull away from shore. Be aware that you might drift out. Rescuers say Declan did everything right by staying on the raft until help arrived. They also say he did, quote, an amazing job at staying calm. Let's go across the pond now to Bruno Rover in the London Bureau. Good morning, Bruno. So what do you have for us today? Well, we're going to start off with quite a controversial report that's been released by the Vatican to outline their official stance on transgenderism. The report fairly unambiguously called uh, Male and Female He Created Them seeks to sort of help give guidance to uh, ch teachers, to parents, to clergy um, over transgender issues. They argue, and I'm going to read here because it's going, they argue that gender debate is, it's the gender fluidity is a confused concept of freedom based on momentary desires and that the primacy of the male and female form should be maintained and that children should be taught about the essential core nature of masculinity and femininity and what they're there to do, which essentially is procreation. They say that the transgenderism, if you like, is essentially anti-nature and that you can't just choose your gender depending on how you feel. So that's fairly unambiguous there. Moving on, Bruno, to another controversy brewing over an ancient statue of yes. Egypt's King Tut. It's scheduled to go up for auction next month, but Egypt is demanding the statue be returned, saying it was stolen? Yes, well, they're, they're, they're saying it was smuggled out of the country. It's quite interesting. This is, this is ahead of an auction at Christie's Auction House in July um, of pieces from the Rosandro private collection. This is a 3,000-year-old statue of Tutankhamun, which they say was taken out of the country illegally without proper paperwork and should be returned. Now, actually, Egypt has sought to control the flow of artifacts from their country from 1835 um, and then formalize the more stringent um, st um, conditions for taking uh, stuff out of the country or selling stuff that's already been taken out in 1983. And they're saying that this particular statue doesn't correspond to that. Christie's are pushing back and saying it's impossible to track uh, millennia old artifacts and that they've done all the necessary tests and that this is a bona fide sale. But it's, it's interesting because this is increasingly becoming an issue around the world with countries looking to claim back um, artifacts that they say have been looted. Quite often they have been, frankly. And even stuff that's been taken centuries ago during the colonial era, they're also looking to have those returned. So it's a very controversial area. So it's interesting to see how this pans out. Um, apparently no statue of limitations there. All right, Bruno Robert, <laughs> thank you, very my good. friend. Good to see you.
Let's get a check of our notifications, starting with some shellfish. Some people in Japan Whoa, ordered this, and it starts moving the on their plate. It's got to be dead for me to eat it. It's not cooked? That is gross. Yep. That is licking nasty. Um, so that's our question of the day. Would you eat these? No. Tell us in the comments or tweet us at ABC News Live to let us know. Maybe you need to put some hot sauce on there, some ketchup, some mayo chuck, cranch. What, what do we call it? Cranch and... What did that thing I eat? Mayo chuck. No, you remember the thing I, I ate? Some cranch. Ketchup and cranch. I'm Yuck. slow this morning. All right, so next up, a creepy creature caught on a home security camera. Take a look. What do you is think it is? Is it um, an uh, alien? Is it out of the X Files, or is it? Or somebody doing the stanky leg? The stanky doing leg. The, stanky the daughter leg. just out there trying to impress her parents and say, "Get out of bed and show us how to dance." We're impressed. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Speaking of creepy, you remember that scary, scary movie, The Nun, that I came do. out last year? It was horrible. Features a terrifying, uh -huh. de demonic nun. One little girl wanted nothing more than a nun-themed birthday, and she got it because take a look at these look at images that. there. She's like, love it. Very happy. Very Wednesday, Adam. Very scary. That's crazy. Love it. Mm -hmm. Finally, don't try this at home. British woman thought she could fit inside a toy car, and well, yeah, she did. She did. She I fit right inside it. Problem is, she couldn't get out of it. She was stuck for an hour. Her dad cut her out using a bread knife. That's crazy. Wow. Coming up, why sleeping with the TV on could add inches to your waistline. What a new study says about artificial light and your metabolism after this. Here's what to watch out for today. President Trump travels to Iowa to tour a renewable energy facility and speak at the annual dinner for the State Republican Party. And former Vice President Joe Biden will also be campaigning in Iowa after skipping a key event over the weekend there to attend his granddaughter's graduation. SpaceX is set to launch a Falcon 9 rocket carrying Earth observation satellites from California. You can see that right here on ABC News Live. Then Nintendo takes its turn on stage at the E3 Expo. They're expected to make some big announcements about upcoming games. And the U.S. women's national soccer team takes the field against the Thai, against Thailand in the first round of the World Cup. Plus, don't forget to tune into the debrief for an update on all our top stories and the briefing room for a breakdown of the latest headlines in politics. Researchers are raising a health alert over something that so many of us are guilty of, falling asleep in front of the TV. We've all been there, and you know you should be asleep, but your favorite episode of any show is on, so you leave on the TV, because how much damage could it really do? Well, Will Gans tells us. How's life on the red planet? <laughs> it's killing me. I can't eat, I can't sleep. All I can see is that giant red sun in the shape of a chicken. For most of us, the artificial light in our rooms won't be as dramatic as Kramer's in this classic Seinfeld episode. But a new study from the National Institutes of Health shows that light from a TV or a lamp can cause more than enough damage of its own. A startling new study suggesting those sources of light can mix up metabolism, leading to weight gain and even obesity. Researchers analyzing health and lifestyle data from 44,000 U.S. women for over five years. Those who sleep in a room with the TV or a light left on were more likely to gain at least 11 pounds compared to those who keep the room totally dark. They were also about 30% more likely to become obese. Scientists believe the artificial light disrupts biological processes like circadian rhythm and can alter hormones, leading to the weight gain. They also say that although this specific research only focused on women, they'd expect the same results in men. Wow, so that was eye-opening. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. That's uh, it from us. And we will see you tomorrow. Can't wait. Have a good one. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.